number six, <laughs> I've only got one hand, is um, John, I'm going to go and visit a car tomorrow and I need to know where all the rust spots are so I can inspect it so I know how to buy it or will you come with me? Uh, no, I won't come with you. <laughs> and no, I can't point at every possible rust spot because everywhere on these vehicles can rust. Are they a real rust bucket? No. They're a 26 year old design, uh, but most of the vehicles have lived in the UK, at least at some point. So therefore, salt air, salt roads have got at them. And you look at any other vehicle this age, it's probably been swept up and put in a skip by now. So no, they're not rust buckets, but they do have rust areas. You need to look at a car with time, a ramp, and an expert if you want to know that it is rust free. But here's my quick, quick guide. Start at the back. They rust here. They rust along here in the gap between the bumper and the bodywork. This area is often very rusty or missing because it's been cut off, this return on the back of the sill. Check about an inch in for rust bubbles coming up here. And the whole of the arch is prone to rusting. And you may see scars or some sort of disturbance in the paint that shows that a new piece of metal has been cut in. We occasionally see rust here. You will inevitably see rust on these grey areas around the windows. Um, my strips that were here were quite corroded, hence my replacement stainless ones. Um, they're very expensive to buy, so be prepared to live with what you buy or get them repainted, and that's not going to be cheap. This area here, same reason that the ones at the back, rusts because it collects rubbish. Can't really show you in this quick video, but if we follow a line from the door mirror straight down, then go forward by about six inches and then go to the center of the footwell on both sides. There is a square-ish plate, one corner is cut off, about eight inches square, but is welded to the floor. That plate is just used as a location aid for the production line. It is welded onto the car, it traps dirt and can cause the floors to rot out. Inside the wheel arch, Behind the subframe, there's a area that can rust out behind the aluminium section. You're only gonna to get to see that wheels off, car jacked up, good strong light. So not an easy thing if you're doing a quick inspection of a car to buy. Stone chips are common along here, low nose, and the nose cones have invariably been repainted because of stone chips. Uh, but they're plastic, so nothing to worry about there. I have other videos on it, so I'm not going to go into detail and rip my car apart right now, but if you go into this corner, pull back the carpet, look down behind the boot floor, behind here, there is a vent that allows air to move in and out of the boot with a flap on it. In that area, around that area, can become quite rotten. Under the bonnet, check in this compartment. And if it's red rusty in the bottom, then water has been leaking into there and it can cause some real issues. It should be body colored, nicely painted, bit dusty, dirty, but if it's red rusty, walk away. On the sills, there is a seam. You can get rust around there, or some cars have that seam missing. That means it's either been dressed in a body shop 
to an exceptionally high standard and had the seam welded up. So you're looking at a very, very well looked after or modded car. Or it may be a sign that somebody's covering up rust. And whilst it's not actually rust I'm talking about here, always check this area for being wet and look underneath your floor mats at the base of this sill area because seals fail in this area and drainage channels fail and they dump their water this side and once this area starts to get wet it soaks up the moisture in the sound deadening gets under the carpet and can rot out again the floor wells number seven my sign language is getting better um, emissions. John, my card keeps failing its emissions test in my territory. Um, does it mean the engine's gone? Should I just get rid of it? Should I give them the £6,000 they're asking for for a new ECU? <sighs> no. Do the cheap and easy things first. If your car is failing an emissions test, then that means that the fuel-air mixture is wrong it's probably meaning that it's running rather rich or it is burning oil so check out the things you can check out for free if you find faults with any of these things chances are you've found the issue this long trumpet and its box is the air intake system start with this box open it up See if it's got a filter in it. If it's not got a filter in it, put a filter in it. If the filter in it is filthy, put a clean filter in it. Next, depending on model, it might look slightly different for different years, but this is the mass airflow sensor. This tells the engine how much air it's just sucked in. And it is just there, just after the air filter. If this is dirty, is not working properly, is blocked, then it will tell the car the wrong amount of air is entering and it, therefore it'll mix with the wrong amount of fuel. There is uh, aerosol based mass airflow sensor cleaners. Um, never ever touch the little wire that's inside this. Uh, I've got other videos on mass airflow sensors if you want to check them out. Um, spray clean them or replace this unit with a known good one. Next, this trumpet is plastic this is relatively rigidly mounted there's a rubber mount here the engine although smooth moves so this is constantly twitching hence one of the many reasons it's got this concertina in it this needs to be airtight check the joins check the seals take this off shine a really strong light in it look for pinholes Make sure that this is mounted properly, bolted down and the seal is intact and in the right place. Check that your breather hoses are connected, are not leaking, you've got air holes in them and are not blocked. You squeeze and remove and you can blow this through with WD-40, clean it out. Make sure the hole going through into the cam cover is clean and not blocked. There is another one. On the other side here again just pull this cover off for better access to have a little look these pipes are delicate be really careful that you don't break them because they've become embrittled over time this one you wouldn't be able to completely remove easily because it goes underneath the manifold but uh, check that the hole through into the cam cover is clean if either of these are blocked will cause the engine to breathe more oil and that will, again, throw your emissions out. If none of those things are found to be the problem, then the next most likely items are connected with the exhaust system. It can be blocked, it can have a hole in it, the catalytic converters can be collapsed or crumbling or heavily decayed. Typically though, for a catalytic converter, if it's really gone to pot, when you blip the throttle at idle, you'll hear what sounds like stones being rattled in a tin can. And that is the ceramic core is actually starting to break down inside the catalytic converter and you can hear it rattling around. Or one of your two tailpipes will give an awful lot more gas than the other. 
If it's blowing blue smoke, then obviously we've got other issues. But if it's just um, clean, then wait until it's cold in the morning. Start your car and you'll see the fumes coming out. Should be even from both banks. If it's not, suspect something blocked in the exhaust as long as the engine sounds smooth. If the engine doesn't sound smooth, then you may be pushing completely unburnt fuel at the exhaust pipe. And that would be down to typically spark plugs that have failed and they are under here or the coil packs, which are individual coils, <coughs> one per spark plug that are pushed on top of each of those. One of those has failed. If it's none of those things, then start to get a little bit twitchy. Look for blue smoke. If you can't see blue smoke, hold a white piece of paper about 18 inches behind your car when it is well warmed up. And get somebody to blip the throttle a few times, run through the various revs. Yes, you're probably gonna get a little bit of wet on your paper, condensation sort of stuff. Yes, you might get the odd bit of soot blown onto your paper. But if you see anything that looks a little bit oily, um, a brown stain or the paper starts to get transparent, it's blowing oil out the back. If you see a mark on a piece of paper and you think, is that oil? Take the paper, drop a little bit of alcohol on it. If it radiates out in rainbow colors, it's probably oil. That means oil is getting past the um, piston rings. And if your breather system is okay, then maybe you've got worn bores. Maybe you've got a valve that isn't closing properly. Maybe you've got piston ring issues. Then, yeah, consult somebody. You've got to start paying somebody maybe to do some work for you. If you're a little bit more adventurous, you could do a compression check, um, take out spark plugs, screw in a compression tester and see if you get the same compression or pressure um, generated by each of the pistons each of the cylinders. If you've got one that's down, it's probably an indication. EC, ECUs do fail, but it's not common. So be a little bit skeptical of a garage you just out of hand says, oh yeah, it's all over the place. Engine ECU needs changing. Probably means we can't remap this to make the problem go away. Can't be asked to change it. Expensive, under there, not commonly the issue. Number eight. John, um, I've heard on your channel a lot that most problems seem to be connected with the battery and if it's not the battery, then it's a bad earth lead. Can you show me how to test my earth lead to see if it really is the issue, please? Yeah, I answer this question about once a week. And again, I don't mind answering it, so carry on asking if you really want. But I think it's quite difficult in text form to explain. So this is the earth lead, goes from the negative terminal of your battery to the bodywork. So the whole of the metalwork of your car is connected to the negative side of your battery. And this cable, mine is an excellent cable, this cable is uh, very often the cause of issues because the Jaguar XK8, XKR, X100 is incredibly sensitive to voltage fluctuations, current fluctuations. So if you've got a poor battery or this lead is poor, you will get all manner of electrical gremlins. There are many ways of checking this and if you're an electrician, you're gonna have your own ways. My ways are pretty straightforward. I will take a reading of the resistance or ohms on your uh, electrical meter from here to here. I will leave the meter connected and then I will shake this cable. Now on mine, you can't shake it because this is a really, really substantial piece of kit. Most cars will not be fitted with this. This was fitted to the very first cars launched, like mine, and I believe to be a hangover from the XJS models, or late XJS models. Later cars will have a braided cable, much like the positive, which is quite 
flexible, but the quality is not that great. And when you shake it, if your value for resistance moves dramatically, then you've got issues. Another good way of doing it is put the voltage meter on the positive terminal and then connect to an earth point. Not necessarily this. I would suggest this bolt down here, this bolt here, or if you haven't got your boot floor in, the bolt that actually attaches the spare wheel to the floor. They're all good earth points, reliable um, bolts that go into bare metal. You can actually use this one. Um, so what you're gonna do is check the voltage and you're effectively just checking the battery voltage. It will read slightly lower than if you read across here. Again, with that connected, shake this cable. If moving it causes the voltage to change by more than about 0.1 of a volt, suspect the cable. A really good way of checking it is connector here, connector here, and then get a jump lead, literally that sort of thing, one cable, and whilst you're checking the voltage that you get from here to here or any of these other non-negative battery terminal points, take the jump lead and connect it to the negative terminal and to where this negative terminal is bolted at the other end. So what you've done is just doubled up. You've got two cables running from the negative to the earth. If connecting that up makes the voltage change, then this is not good enough. You may get a very small movement, but again, it should be less than 0.1 of a volt, really. Anything more than that, look at ditching this and putting in a thicker cable, because at the moment you're saying your jump lead is better. Number nine, back to our old friend, I can't get into the boot because my battery's flat. I mean, the number of questions I answer on that is off the scale. Um, yes, it's very hard to get into the boot if it's locked and the secret key doesn't work and your remote won't open the boot and, 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 etc. The chances of three separate systems all failing at the same time are negligible. You would really have to be ignoring faults on your car a lot so that the remote control won't open the boot, the switch on the dashboard won't open the boot, and a key in the keyhole won't open the boot. Very occasionally, cables snap and, you know, there's no way of predicting those things. But nine times out of 10, the boot will open using the electronic system if the battery was working, and that's where people get into this endless cycle of, I want to get to charge the battery. I get lots of questions about how to open the boot using an external power source. And uh, I always have to be very careful about how I answer it because you can do yourself, do your car harm. So you open the bonnet. There is a terminal just there on the fuse box under the bonnet. If I lift the lid, it gives you a better indication of what you're looking at. That is the positive supply to this fuse box. The bolts which hold your uh, top strut into place, make a very good earth point. Connect a negative terminal of a battery to here. Connect a positive terminal of a battery to here. Then go and press the button on your dashboard just there, or obviously the opposite side if you're in a left-hand drive country, that opens the boot lid. Then disconnect from those points. This is where the caveats come in real strong, guys. Do not start your car or try to start your car 
using that as the jump point. You will blow fuses, you will arc out relays, you may damage other things. It is not intended for starter current to be drawn back through anything here. But you can put in some current to trip a little switch and a tiny solenoid to open the boot lid and that's fine. In exceptional circumstances, you could charge your battery using these two, but you would want to be using a slow, steady trickle charge to do so. And again, disconnect before you make any attempt to start your car. And as I repeat to everybody who has uh, any advice for eventually gets their boot lids open, immediately <coughs> go to your car and check to see if the key works in the keyhole. We'll open the boot and for 99% of people in the world, you go through this hole here, between the X and the K, to find the secret keyhole. For me, I go through here. That's just because my car's a bit odd. That opens the boot. If that doesn't work, when you try it today, start thinking about getting it cleaned. If you're not competent yourself, get somebody to fix that for you, because that is the workaround for all of your problems. We can't complain that our boots are shut and Jaguar has locked us out how daft when they provided the system to work around the electronics not working. Because that is a vault. And much as I've done lots of videos on how to break into it, you don't want to do any of them. They're expensive, scary, etc. Our channel's not very much about the X150, the aluminium, um, the aluminium car that came after ours, but there are the odd secret I share, just because I know it, and there's the equivalent of this security workaround, but it's not hidden in the badge. You unscrew your number plate, or tear it off if it's been stuck on. Behind the number plate is a keyhole. That is your emergency keyhole, which means, unfortunately, you can't test it very easily. Um, but it does mean it tends to stay a lot cleaner. And number 10. Should I get an XK8 or an XKR? Ooh, now we're talking fights. If you particularly want a car that is still devastatingly quick today, despite being very old, you are going to go and get yourself an XKR. XKRs are significantly faster. Clinical as that. Depending on the year and which ones you're comparing, you're looking at anything between a second to nearly two seconds off the 0 to 60 time. However, in most other regards, the XK8 is the same car. Your XKR is delivering that extra punch by having a twin scroll supercharger on top of the same or very similar engine, different ancillaries, tweaks, etc. And again, years change what sort of spec we've got. What else are you getting on an XKR? You are typically getting Brembo brake sets, which are bigger diameter discs, bigger calipers, and they do give better stopping feel and better stopping power. However, well-sorted XK8 brakes will give you almost, if not exactly the same, stopping distances. The feel of the brakes on the XK8 is longer travel, softer. However, XKR brakes compared to even a, a modern hot hatch. You jump out of a um, Mark 8 Golf, you jump into one of these and you'll think that the brakes are really bad. I nearly said a dirty word. Um, however, if you actually look at braking distances, what you'll find is an XKA or an XKR will be stopping probably faster than a Mark 8 Golf. The travel on the pedal, the feel on the pedal is modulated to allow a more luxurious experience, not to give jerky progress, to be able to pull up at traffic lights from speed, ease off the pedal, and uh, not get that bang 
and rock back feeling. But yes, you do get bigger, nastier brakes on an XKR. Downside of that is just expense in terms of pads and discs. They are significantly dearer to, to service. All the XKRs will have CATS suspension, which means they've got magnetically uh, adjusted dampers or shock absorbers. Uh, that doesn't mean you can't have those on an XK8. They're an option. Stance. You've got about one inch lower ride height as standard on an XKR, but it is just spring adjustment. So again, that can happen to your XK8. You do get a spoiler on the back of the XKR, but it is yay big. So the visual impact, whilst positive and you know aggressive, is not significant. And it's obviously something that's relatively easy to retrofit. The interiors of XKRs tend towards sport trim, but the high contrast trims, dark dashboards, and are less obvious as classics. Classic being everything's pale leather, pale colors, etc., and you get pale carpets. So again, you can have, like mine, an XK8 that has sport trim and therefore looks a little more aggressive or sporting inside. Possibly the biggest reasons that the XKR could be said to be better looking, you will have the big vents either side of the bonnet bulge, which are functional. They allow the extra heat to be dissipated, but it's generated by the engine, um, and they do look great. Uh, I will be the first to confess that the bonnet looks nicer on the XKR. However, if like me, you like to keep your engine clean and tidy, they're big open gaps into the engine and you tend to end up with rusty stains and dust and dirt everywhere. Um, the front end, the grill, if you like, on an XK8 like mine, should have the single blade and two bunny teeth. If you've got an XKR, it will, depend on year and model, have a mesh grill, which either goes from here to the bunny teeth, another one here, another one there, or goes straight across the front of the whole thing. But you will actually be able to see the vestigial bunny teeth under these covers behind it. So it's just a mesh grill. All could be retrofitted to an XK8 if you wanted that cosmetic look. And an XKR, will typically have black headlight inners. So the reflector area here and here will still be silvered, but the rest of this will be matte black inside. So you won't have this bright work that I've got and this serrated effect. It'll all be matted out in black, less obvious. Wheels and tires do tend to be the larger and more expensive items, BBSs, um, split rims, uh, wheels of embellishers, etc. But again, you can fit those to any XK8, XKR. Um, you can't fit all of the XK8 wheels to an XKR because the wheels have to be big enough to accommodate the Brembo brakes. But these wheels would fit, for instance, an XKR. So why haven't I got an XKR as an, a mega fan of the model. Well, I love this car quite a lot. I loved the car I had before, which was also an XK8. And I did say I would never sell it, but yeah, see what happens. Uh, I had, it wasn't a money limitation that said to me, buy this and not an XKR. I liked the trim. I liked the color. I liked the condition. And I'd enjoyed driving my XK8 so much because I felt I could drive it spiritedly and use 90% of its performance potential on uh, the quiet lanes around where I live and really enjoy it. Uh, I would enjoy taking this on a track day. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, if I had an XKR, I wouldn't be able to safely use any more power on the road. 
on a track day it would be probably a little bit more entertaining but I've had this one for six years and it's never been on track yet. The soundtrack of an XKR is dramatic because on acceleration the sound of the supercharger whine is intoxicating, it's otherworldly. Um, I guess in terms of modern cars, the only vehicle on the market that I'm aware of that's got a similar in-your-face supercharger sound is the American Hellcat. That's got that same in-your-face supercharger sound. It's fantastic, I would love that. But if I'm absolutely honest, I would also want to be able to turn it off, and you can't, because it's the dominant sound in the interior of the car is the whine in the background when you're pulling. And I love the V8 burble. And if you're a fan of V8s for the V8 burble, then NXK8 is gonna give you more of that more of the time when you're not doing daft and illegal things. My car's got the Adamesh exhaust system on it, which opens it up a little bit more, makes it pick up a little bit quicker, but mainly it's there for the sound. And on an XKR, it's going to be cacophonous. It's going to be fantastic, but it's still going to be drowned on the interior, particularly in the coupe, by the supercharger wine, which is the dominant sound. So, yeah, I haven't got one because I don't need to go any quicker. I prefer the sound of the XK8. I didn't need to have to spend another 1500 to 2000 pounds, which is typically the difference between the two models. So I think go and get what you fancy, but don't imagine that the XK8 is the inferior model. It's the slower of two fast, very beautiful cars. I hope you enjoyed that. I might do another one of those on probably the next 10 um, questions that I get repeatedly asked just because I can share things quite quickly, speaking better than written. And uh, I've got a video coming up real soon showing you the details of what I've got in my garage at the moment, which will give away a lot of the next mods, tweaks and maintenance projects on Purdy the XK8. See you soon. If you're enjoying our channel, then don't forget to subscribe and click the little bell icon so you get notifications of new videos. And please give us a thumbs up or thumbs down and you can share the videos. And below the video is always the area where you can comment and get involved with the chat.